Hey, y'all. I'm Jeffrey Rickman. I'm a pastor in the Global Methodist Church in northeastern Oklahoma, tiny rural place called Nowata. I love it. There's no place else I want to be. But uh, I do like having conversations with big, important people about big, important things. And if you don't know it, the Global Methodist Church is having a big, important uh, gathering next week in uh, San Jose, where we're going to decide who we're going to be as a denomination. We're going to lay out all the, the basic building blocks of uh, how our Constitution is going to work, how we're going to do Episcopacy, how it is that we're going to share in covenant together. There are already people from all over the world that have joined this denomination, and there are already uh, thousands, if not millions, of people praying for our den denominational gatherings. So I've started a morning live stream series from 7.30 to 8.30 Central Time, where I'm just walking through the petitions that have been published. I've been talking to people on the legislative committees that are reviewing these petitions and trying to prepare them for presentation to the larger body next month. And I, there's still way more to know than I, I can know. I have a very small brain, but I've tried to go through the material and talk to the right people so as to open the process as much as possible to uh, the people who are concerned. And so to that end, I've actually reached out to Nate Fugate, and he's been a, a, a guest on the show before. We spoke about abortion with our two wives, and that was a really great segment. But today we're talking about constitutional law and what it has to do with the Global Methodist Church. So Nate, so much, uh, thank you so much for spending time with me this morning. Well, thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk with you. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good for me, at least. I know that I do not have the acumen and the knowledge needed. I've already gone through a lot of the constitutional uh, petitions right at the front end. I've, I've gone through uh, Petition 20 through 28, I think, and I think there were three or four petitions in there that have to do with, well, the restrictive rule is what I dealt with this morning, uh, but there had also been some other stuff. And so... Um, I saw that you have a Substack that you've already started where you've been publishing on these things. Could you tell my audience about your Substack a bit? Yeah, that was something that uh, my, my mentor, Bob Zillhaver, and I started uh, just because we recognize that most people don't really think a whole lot about constitutional law. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we were sharing a little earlier that it's a pretty dry subject. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of give a, a broad overview of how the Constitution has functioned in Methodist history, looking back to our roots, uh, finding out why it's important, um, and then also thinking forward of, of looking at the petitions that are going to be in front of the General Conference um, and weighing in on the, the value of some of them. We obviously can't talk about all of them. Um, I only have so many hours in the day. Uh, <clears throat> but hopefully it gives people at least a rough understanding of the terms we're using and uh, why we do some of the weird things that we do. Yeah, so um, give everybody the the URL, the, the web address for your Substack. Where can they go to check out those articles? Uh, the Substack is... Um, oh, now you're going <laughs> to... <laughs> I think I've got it pulled up right here. Let me... T it's um, Rev Nathanael fugate.substack.com. And I will have that in the show notes so people can check it out. But the, the articles you've generated there are co-authored by Bob Zillhaber, who's your mentor. Is it from him that you got this concern for constitutional law, or, or where does this nerdiness come from in you? Uh well, it, it was certainly nurtured by him. Um, he and I did a lot of work when we were in the United Methodist Church working with uh, particularly the Judicial Council, uh, trying to hold uh, bishops uh, accountable to the Constitution and to the Book of Discipline. And so we did a lot of work there, and he showed me a lot of the ropes, helped me uh, correct a lot, a lot of my misunderstandings about uh, how we function. Um, he even had me sit in the church library until I memorized all of the uh, different sections of the discipline <laughs> uh, before I could come out and get lunch. So he uh, he was very good in, in un helping me understand uh, how that all worked together. Wow, I never had anybody get that serious with me about it. So yeah, he really, you know, wax on, wax off, Miyagi'd you. So that's, that. I don't know if you know that reference, but man, he, he really trained you good. So um, what are some important things for people to know about constitutional law before we look at the actual petitions? Well, it's very important that people understand that this is the foundation that everything that we do in the rest of the dis discipline is founded upon. 
Um, and uh, it's important because it's also the, the most difficult to, to change and to update. Uh, so, for example, everything else in the, comp or in the book of discipline can be changed by a simple majority vote uh, at every general conference. And so if we get something wrong or we, we change our opinions on something, then we can, we can adjust those every two or six years as uh, it's proposed in, in the GMC. The Constitution's a, a much higher threshold of changing. And so it's a, right now it's proposed to be a two-thirds uh, majority of everyone who's voting in the general conference, as well as a two-thirds aggregate of all of the voting members of all of the annual conferences. Um, that's not of the annual conferences, it's of the voting members of the annual conferences. So if your conference has uh, just a few delegates and your another conference has a lot of delegates, your conference doesn't get any more say uh, than the, the larger conference because it's based on your actual voting members at that uh, conference. Right, and that's paragraph, so, uh, not paragraph, that's petition number 23, I believe. And I was reading that just this morning. I didn't see language that was specific about annual conference delegates rather than the annual conference uh, decision. So maybe we can go over that today, but I had that as a concern because yeah. I knew that's how we did things in the United Methodist Church. I just assumed it would carry over. Um, to your mind, is two-thirds uh, a sufficient margin? I... It is, uh, for, for the Constitution, it is, one of the things that we're always trying to balance is you want to be flexible enough to fix problems, but it's harsh enough that it's not flippantly done. Okay. Um, and figuring out what that threshold is, is uh, can be challenging. I think the two-thirds, especially when we get into the, the two-thirds of all of the meth on the world, in addition mm -hmm. to the general conference, I think that's a reasonable threshold for uh, changing the Constitution. Um, others might disagree with me on that, but uh, I, and then I think it's a reasonable. The the other margin I noticed, and I think what I understood is, there is a three-quarters margin for changing something, but I think it was just for the doctrinal standards. Have I recalled that correctly? Yes, in the, uh, well, we have the restrictive rule, and that's a okay. higher threshold. So the restrictive rule is basically saying these are the most core elements of who we are as a, as a denomination. And so we're only going to change them if the vast, vast majority of everyone is on board with that. Okay, okay. So we've got the restrictive rule, which is the most important stuff. Is there anything outside of the doctrinal standards that, that fit in that category? Uh, well, well, we'll talk about that because okay. uh, that's okay. the petitions that I've put forward to work on the restrictive rule. Okay, so we got the restrictive rule, then the rest of the Constitution, that's a two-thirds uh, vote at general conference plus two-thirds of the candidates of, not can delegates of all the annual conferences. Then you've got the rest of the um, uh, Book of Doctrines and Discipline that only require a majority vote and no ratification process. And then you've got just resolutions that who who cares? They don't matter anyway. So uh, yeah, are there, say that again? Yeah, if we end up even having them. Oh, we might not even have resolutions. Okay. Well, I, I think we've laid good groundwork. So um, I've got the pre-conference petitions report open as published on August 23rd. I think you have a different version, but it should largely overlap. Um, mm -hmm. So this, what we're going to do now is go through some of the petitions. You're going to lead the way. And then the, the portion of my audience that I think we want to cater to, if we can try and do two audiences, one is just interested observers who want to know why this matters, but two, if delegates, um, and I realize a lot of delegates on your legislative committee are listening to you and reading your stuff, and, but what are some things that the delegates, the broader body of delegates, whenever it comes before them, need to understand as they go through this material? Um, so lead the way in whatever direction you want to go, and, and uh, this is my screen, everybody. This is the pre-conference petitions report, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go where Nate tells me. Well, you've uh, covered a, a little bit of the, uh, the pe petitions um, 20, 20 through 23, uh, you said, mm -hmm. and uh, I watched your, your live stream yesterday, and I know you covered at least uh, the 20 and 21. Yeah, I did. Yesterday, I did 20, um, 21, I, and 22. Well, one thing I do want to point out is the way that things are ordered, if people are reading along uh, with the petitions that you have, is that 
the the ordering of the petitions, the numbering of the petitions, I should mm -hmm. say, is I believe based on uh, chronological order, which is essentially when they were received. Um, uh -huh. And so the constitutional petitions are are not all together. Right. So, for example, the constitutional petitions go like 21, 22, 23, and then they jump to 47. And then the next one is 108. And so if if people look into the table of contents, you'll see that under the constitutional section, um, they go in order numerically under that section, but uh, you're not going to find them in, in the broad grouping of all of the legislation together. Yeah, you can see that here starting in 20, 21, 22. It looks like it's in order 23 and then oop, 47 and then into the hundreds. Although it looks like a lot of them are grouped together in the 160s and 170s. So we'll see if I make it that far. And then you skip to 271. Uh, draft yeah. of the new Articles the of Faith. And the, Sorry. Yeah, and the, the 160s and 170s that are all grouped together are, mm -hmm. and, and this is a good caveat for me, are grouped together because they are petitions that actually came out of my church that I helped author and submitted them all together. So that's why they're all grouped together is because chronologically, I just spent an afternoon and submitted them all. Um, <laughs> and so most of those uh, I helped author and then are the church council at our church perfected before we submitted them as a church. So just a caveat, I do have a vested interest and I am non-biased when it comes to those particular petitions. Yeah, I think it's good to say that on the front end. Uh, can you summarize what your principles, your personal principles are as you come to this? Like what what it is, what what values you have that have guided you in, in suggesting these amendments? Yeah, I, I think that the, the primary responsibility of the Constitution is to be the framework for the church. And if you have a strong framework, then you allow for more freedom within that framework. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have a weak framework and then and, and things can squeak out of that framework, then that's where you run into a lot of problems. Sure. And so a lot of my petitions were geared towards either fixing internal issues uh, of the Constitution itself and also looking at and learning from our history, both as Wesleyans throughout our uh, almost 300 years or over 300 years of, of work, um, as well as uh, things that we can learn from the United Methodist Church and how the Constitution failed it in many ways and hopefully avoiding those things. So I would say the, the petitions, the, the proposed Constitution, which is petitions 20 through 23, is a really good document. I think that the, the Transitional Leadership Council did an outstanding job in crafting that together. Um, and if we pass it right now with, with no changes, it will be good enough. But uh, I think that the changes that I'm suggesting and some others are suggesting will help down the road. So I'm thinking, how do we protect the church? Not right now, um, but in 50 years, sure. in 70 years, when I'm no longer alive, can we put in stop gaps uh, for the work that we do that will help my children have a, a good framework to live within the Global Methodist Church? Mind me, uh, in order for these amendments to be adopted, do they have to, what margin do they have to clear? I believe all of this, anything that has to do with the Constitution is going to have to be approved by a two-thirds majority of the uh, General Conference. And then I think it's still going to be sent to the rest of the church uh, for ratification. Uh, mm. And so if we actually want to jump ahead or jump back to uh, Petition 23, <clears throat> okay, and we can look at Article 13 there, uh, just because we had some questions uh, about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've got it right here, I think. And, uh, yep, I'm just going to read. The amendments to the Constitution may originate in the General Conference, a regional conference, or an annual conference. So this is how amendments get before the floor of the General Conference. Mm -hmm. Except in the case of the restrictive rule, which shall require a three-fourths majority of those members present in voting both the General Conference and the annual conferences, Amendment shall be made by a two-thirds majority of the general conference president of voting, followed by a two-thirds affirmative vote of the aggregate number of members of the annual conferences present in voting. And oh, so you're right. That, yeah, that, okay. Which, I don't know how I missed that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so that aggregate means that it is all of the voting members of the annual conferences together. Mm -hmm. Do we have two-thirds of those people also affirming? So right. if our whatever we, we come up with as a document for our constitution— um, 
will be sent to, I believe, the rest of the world to to affirm whatever we have. Okay. Yes. Good. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know if you want me to, I, I can talk to all of the, the petition talk most informally about my own petitions, of course, um, but were there were there things within the the first uh, three legislative uh, twenty through twenty three that is the proposed constitution that you had questions about that you wanted to talk about specifically before we got to any of the amendments to those things? You know, I bet I did, but I have already just moved on in my life from those questions. Um, I'm sure they will come right back up whenever I look at them again. But a lot of it sounded very straightforward. There were a couple things that um, I can remember kind of raising my eyebrows out that that seemed a, a little broad or vague, but can they? are they coming to me right now? No, they are not coming to me right now. So uh, do you think that there are any things worthy of note? I mean, you did say... It's a very fine document. If it passed tomorrow, it'd be just fine. Even so, were there things that you... Well, we could talk about those, actually, when we look at your amendments to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with just moving straight to it. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Okay, so rem which one are we going to first? Uh, we'll jump ahead to 160. So 160. That is, uh, 160, yep. Okay. And like I said, they're all in order, uh, except for one one position that got squeaked in while I was including mine. So uh, we should be able to just kind of scroll down on your own page. Yeah, I've got it at 160, um, Shreve Community Church. This one is called to amend Article 2 of the proposed Constitution. Yep. So th this is a very good example of it's fine the way that it is, but I, I think that we can add in special protections that will help us down the road. Okay. Um, so if you want to scroll down to the therefore be it resolved, the whereas is are basically just saying in all of these, hey, this is why it's uh, appropriate to have this before this particular general conference, because okay. it's a restricted, uh, uh, restricted legislative work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but yeah, on Article 2, uh, we're actually writing out what some of the doctrinal standards are. And so if you can see the underlying portions um, the doctrines of the church shall be those embraced within the historic creeds of the church are articles of religion, confessions of faith. And then I'm including Wesley's explanatory notes upon the New Testament, the standard sermons of John Wesley as well. <clears throat> um, and and the reason for that is not. I, I had a number of people who emailed me and said, isn't this redundant? Because we already include the explanatory notes on the New Testament. We already include Wesley's sermons in. So why are you including it? in part one and that's a really good question it comes down to that that threshold of two uh, of three-fourths two-thirds and then a majority uh article or, or section one of the constant sorry section one of the book of doctrines and disciplines is not part of the constitution which means it's under that simple majority to change it rule oh so if we have certain doctrinal standards that are in there, even though they might say, oh, we have these doctrinal standards, if we can change them with a simple majority, well, then they can be changed with a simple majority. Okay. And so some of the work that I'm doing to include it here and also to include those specific things in the restrictive rule is to say, hey, these documents are incredibly important to who we are as Wesleyans. Mm -hmm. What Wesley had to say, how we understood the scriptures, his understanding of uh, the the social life and how we, we are to live together and watch over each other in love, those are integral to who we are. And so those should be protected at a higher level than just a simple majority. Um, and so this is one of those ways of doing that. By writing those out in the Constitution, what we're saying is it's not just a reference to another section of the discipline. We're saying, no, we're actually going to list out the things that are the most important so that we hold those more sacred than the, the rest of the stuff that we might do. Is there a reason, uh, well, I'm sure there is. Tell me why the uh, general rules of the United Societies is not uh, listed here among a protected document. Well, I certainly wouldn't be against having that in there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons for that is because there is already a push to rewrite that in right. updated language. Um, <clears throat> because the those general rules have no not applied to us as a church for a while and that's uh, 
the, the change in the nomenclature that we use that we're not societies anymore, we're a church. Mm -hmm. And so like, we don't have to worry about wearing gold jewelry to church or uh, not imbibing any alcohol or things like that. Now, should we bring those back? I think that's a reasonable conversation to have, but I don't think those things have been set yet. Um, and so I didn't include them there because I know that they're still kind of in flux. The other yeah. things that we've included, I think, are not in flux. They are essential um, and make sure those included. Now, if we want to do an amendment down the road, once we have something a little bit more locked in, mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable conversation to have. Uh, something I noticed this morning is the TLC is making room for a new combined document between the Articles of Religion and the Confession of Faith. Would this uh, uh, amendment that you've submitted um, in any way impact that process or uh, whether it's protected on the other end? Well, that's also another very interesting topic because in the restrictive rule, so the, the confessions of faith and the articles of religion are included in the restrictive rule. That's the uh, four or three-fourths majority highest level thing that we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that restrictive rule, they allow for the creation of a combined articles of religion and confession of faith. And so they are using that language to say, well, we should do that. I, I believe they tried that at the beginning of the United Methodist Church when the EUB and the Methodist Episcopal came together, um, and it didn't pass. And uh, and so I, I think that they might be trying to push for that. Mm -hmm. I am very hesitant at, into, personally uh, to endorse anything like that. Um, because the language that has been proposed, there's two different uh, amendments to do that, one from mm -hmm. the TLC and one from, I believe, an individual uh, that has the words, a synthesis of the two documents. And uh, one is to create a new uh, Articles of Religion and Confession of Faith uh, combination. Okay. And those words of synthesis and new are uncomfortable for me. One, because this is this is law and the words matter and so when we right. allow for combines that's different than a synthesis also i am also concerned that if we do that we could lose the historic language mm -hmm. that we have had in the church now would it be beneficial to have another document that updates the language for people to use i think that could be really helpful especially as we talk about what we actually believe because mm -hmm. most people are not actually reading the articles of religion and confessions of faith as we should be right um but I think that should be in addition to anything that we do. And I would also say that it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, for example, we have the creeds of the church. Those are not in readily accessible language. But we're not asking for a, a re-upping of those things and putting new language for the creeds. And the reason for that is because we believe that the language that we have is important, mm -hmm. that the church has affirmed it, and we shouldn't stray from what the church has has previously said. And so we're not updating the, the definition of Chalcedon, even though that could be a slog to read sometimes um, because that's important. So I would be very cautious about uh, updating these things and changing anything that we have. And if right. we are going to do a combined uh, document, then we should be very, very careful of using as much of the original language as we possibly can. Yeah, I think uh, according to the language of that uh, petition from the TLC to, I don't remember if that one said synthesize or whatever, but um, it has to clear the three quarters margin in order to be uh, adopted. So uh, it, it's all going to be done out in the public. Even if they if they do something that's not very good, it's not going to get approved. So um, right. anything else about this amendment uh, number one sixty? Uh, I don't think so. Like I said, it's just taking those important documents and and putting them within the constitution and therefore giving them a higher bar if we want to change them. Okay. Yeah, that seems like wisdom to me. All right. Um, are we just going down the line, number 161? Uh, if you want to, uh, okay. we, we can move pretty quickly because a lot of the changes are just uh, updates to particular language and, and making sure that uh, everything is consistent within uh, the document itself. Okay. Okay. But uh, 161, I think, is one of the most important ones, even though it might be one of the least understood ones. So if you if you want to scroll down to it, it's trying to amend our, the proposed Article 5. Okay. Is that the one? <clears throat> uh, the General Conference. Okay. Yep. And and I have a number of, of petitions that uh, change try to change the language of, of Article 5, but this might be one of the most important ones. Okay. Uh, and so this is uh, going down to the, the third or the, the third to last paragraph. 
the general conference. Oh, no, right there at the bottom. Okay, the general conference. The general conference shall have full legislative power over all matters that are distinctly connectional. And this is the language that I, I think is very, very dangerous. It is the including but not limited to. Oh. And this is where we get into the idea of the separation of powers and the federalism that exists within the church. So one of the interesting things that we have at, to, to do as a church is we have two conflicting ideals that we're trying to work out. And so the first ideal is we have said that we don't want as bureaucratic of a church as the United Methodist Church was. Uh, so we want to have less structure. We want to have less oversight um, and, and less money working at the, the top levels of the church. <clears throat> so that's one thing that we said we, we want to have as part of our ethos as a church. The other thing is we want to have uh, freedom for local churches to do their work at, at the level that they're doing um, <clears throat> at, at the local church level. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want people going off and doing crazy stuff. Uh, we don't want people violating the doctrines and disciplines of a church. We want to have an accountable church. Mm -hmm. And those two are really difficult to, to synthesize together because if we want to have less oversight, that means we're going to have more freedom and allow people to do more crazy things. That's right. If we're going to have less freedom. That means we have to have more oversight at the upper, upper levels of the church. Yeah, yeah. And, and so... How do we do that well? And so this uh, amendment gets to that question, how do we do that well? And I think we do it best by having what I would call enumerated powers at the general conference level and reserved powers at the annual conference level. Big Versus fancy words to say. Reserved. Right. So okay. enumerated versus reserved. Okay. And those are, are fancy terms to say enumerated just means listed out. Like we actually number them and list them out. Mm -hmm. And reserve means everything that hasn't been said is a, is a very simple way of thinking about it. So the way that it's currently structured is uh, the general conference does have enumerated uh, uh, tasks, uh, responsibilities, but then it has this kind of catch-all, including but not limited to, where it could ostensibly facilitate a future situation where there's overreach on the part of the general conference. This would eliminate the capacity of overreach and uh, give to annual conferences everything that's not explicitly given to general conferences. Part of it's overreach and part of it's... Uh limiting what people can do at, at their local church level. So there's actually really two really good examples from the United Methodist Church that uh, I'll, I'll get into. But uh, yeah, you're, you're right that they enumerate just the things that we list within the Constitution um, and, and later on in the rest of the Book of Discipline. Those are enumerated, they're laid out and articulated. The reserve powers are for anything that's not in the Constitution and anything that's not in the discipline. So we are saying that the general conference has say over everything connectional, and uh, they're going to articulate how they are using that authority through the rest of the book of discipline. And so they're going to pass legislation and do all of these things to say, this is how the annual conference has to do like interviews of the board of ordained ministry, or how it's going to do uh <clears throat> or, or how it's going to, to function with uh, like schools and uh, universities or, or seminaries and things like that. They're going to give oversight on that and say how things are going to work out. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to say everything. Because yeah. if they said everything, then our law book would be a mile wide, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Because every you can't get into every detail. Right. And so the question is, well, how do we play out all the rest of the details? Those are what we would call reserved powers. And I think those are best held at the annual conference because I think the annual conference historically has been the basic body of the church. Mm. And so these would be things, a good example in Western PA, whenever I was in the United Methodist Church, there were certain stipulations <clears throat> about how the Board of Ordained Ministry had to do interviews. Yeah. And so you had a long list, lots of paragraphs on all of the questions that you'd ask and, and all of the educational requirements and things like that. Um, and then the annual conference in, in Western PA actually added on extra things on top of that. Uh, and so we had to do an extra year of provisional membership um, and uh, we had to do like a provisional 
uh, like projects that had to be approved by the Board of Warrior Dane Ministry, they wanted to make sure that we were prepared and had the fruit for ministry in Western PA. And so they added on to what was said without violating what the constitute or what the uh, general conference had already said the the standards were. So another thing that happened in the United Methodist Church was they adopted paragraph 2553 for disaffiliations. Some annual conferences implemented it in a bare-bones way that was not overly uh, cumbersome to local churches, but other annual conferences added, oh, heaps and heaps of barriers to exit, and um, that was defended, you know, under this. Is this kind of the same thing where if an annual conference wants to, they can make certain provisions approved by the general conference much more difficult if they aren't sympathetic to them? It, it certainly could be used that way. Um, and that's the, the double-edged sword of the nature of it. But uh, I, I think a, a better example of why this is important actually played out because of disaffiliation. Uh, there are two judicial council decisions, judicial council decision 1366 and 1344. Uh, if people want to look that I'm up, um, um, if you need help going to sleep at night. Um, <clears throat> but in 1366, uh, there was a question of can annual conferences uh, withdraw? Can they as an annual conference leave. Mm -hmm. And in 1366, the Judicial Council said, yes, uh, they, they have been granted that authority to vote on, on leaving the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And then, in, and so that was an example of the, the general conference has given uh, authority to vote in the Book of Discipline, and therefore they have that enumerated power to do that. Um, and then in 1444, the Judicial Council reversed themselves. And what they said is the annual conferences have the authority to vote because the general conference has given them that authority. Mm -hmm. But they don't actually have the authority to withdraw because the general conference hasn't actually given a process for how they withdraw. Yeah, that's how I remembered so, uh, it. So they have a right and ability to do it, but because you haven't created a, an actual uh, process, then no, you can't do it. It was such a strange decision. So go on. Well, it was a bad decision. I, I think it was a bad decision because it violated the principle of reserved rights. So again, what that really said was the general conference has given them the enumerated power to vote, but they haven't made a process for that. And so it, it hasn't been actually laid out in writing how they're supposed to do that. So who gets to get the authority to make the process? Yeah. And what the Constitution said was, well, that is not an enumerated power. Therefore, it is a reserved power of the annual conference. And so they should be able to make their own process for how they leave. Because they've been given the authority to do so uh, under, uh, under the Constitution and under the reserved powers. Huh. But what the Judicial Council said was, no, 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 no. Uh, this is actually a reserved power that's kept for the for the general conference, hmm. um, even though there was no constitutional granting for that. And so that actually leads, this is a huge problem now for the United Methodist Church is they've just created a system where if the general conference doesn't tell you exactly how to do it, then you're not allowed to do it. Right. Yeah. That's just a crazy standard to establish because uh, <laughs> how many things move uh, through annual conference business that now are subject to um, general conference intervention? Exactly. And so they've taken away a lot of the freedom at the annual conference and local church level because they basically said, nope, all the reserve powers are held at the at the general conference level. And uh, you, you don't have the freedom to actually act on the things that you want to act on. And a really good example of this would be uh, like with with salaries. Right. Yeah. And what what are the minimum salaries or, okay. or what are the any minimum standards that you might set? Well, in like Allegheny West, we vote on what the minimum salary is for our particular context. And that's voted on by the people of the annual conference because we know like the people we live and we know the economic factors that we're involved in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the minimum salary in in Western Pennsylvania or in East Ohio, where I'm at, would not fly in California. Um, I, we do not make enough money here to, to make a, a, a living in California. Mm -hmm. And so we traditionally have said, well, that's an annual conference issue. The general conference says you have to have certain stipulations, but within that you get to make the decision. Mm -hmm. and, and that allows for us to be a more global church because you can think about the conflict that it would be sure. if you had yeah. two global 
from California voting on a minimum salary for the whole church and from Ohio and then from Zimbabwe, right? Sure, like, yeah, yeah. We need the freedom to be able to to work at that more local level. Otherwise, we'll never get anything done and it will be very destructive to the church. So this so, amendment is focused. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Well, I was just going to summarize just these these four, five simple words, including but not limited to, that. that is the issue at play here. If you do not limit their rights, then you can have this kind of constitutional crisis where uh, the general conference can be much more invasive over time. Um, well, you, you, you had some other language there, but all I'm taking away from it, unfortunately, is this protects annual conferences from general conference interloping um, and claiming more authorities than than it should. So, um, and well, the, the example you used is great. The processes that we have, yeah, yeah, right on. Okay. Anything else to say about and this? It also one? protects against getting bogged down in the bureaucracy at the top level. It allows them for more freedom and for us to actually be a global church. Right on. Yes, I think most everybody's in favor of that. All right. Um, petition one sixty two. Take it away. Uh, this is another interesting one, and, and this is where the words that we use matter a whole lot, because again, this is the Constitution, it's the, the foundation. So if you have a foundation that's slightly askew, anything you build on top of that is also going to be askew. And so every okay. every word, I think, matters. Sure. So this is a very simple one. Uh, under art, Article 5, Number 1, this is the enumerated power, so the powers of the the General Conference has uh, within the church to define the qualifications, duties, and responsibilities of those who serve as deacons, elders, other, other clergy categories, bishops, and other leaders within the church. Are you reading and the what, original Article 5? Yes, I'm reading the original Article 5. Okay, I was going to say, okay, that does, okay, let me, let me go there real quick. We're in, uh, let's see, what, what page would that on, be on? Article 5, what, what paragraph are we in? Oh, oh, sorry. I was just reading off of my petition. Oh, but it's I, I on your petition. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, um, is that just at the first whereas? Well, you're on the. You, you jumped ahead of petition. Oh, did I? I thought we were on 162. Yeah, well, we just did 161, and that had uh, the including but not limited to. Oh, okay. And then we're at 162 now, and this is the to amend Article Five one of the proposed yes. constitution. Okay. And so, all right, I'll, I'll just go with you. Where are oh, so we there's on actually this a, It seems like there's actually a misprint in this updated one. Oh. Because I do have one that uh, changes number two, but you, you see how it goes to number two right there? Yeah. Instead of number one. Uh-oh. So we Lamar Oliver needs to know there's been a misprint. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to him and, and make sure that gets gets corrected. Um, okay. Again, he's working with 600 pages, so uh, right. uh, it happens. But so, so mine is to actually remove the word bishops from from that list. So the the powers of the general conference would be to define the qualifications, duties, and responsibilities of those who serve as deacons, elders, other clergy categories, and other leaders within the church. And and it removed the word bishop, which seems odd. Uh, but I'm not actually trying to stop the fact that uh, the General Conference get to say what bishops do. Um, <clears throat> but rather, this is a, an idea of categories. So bishops are already elders within the church. They're not in a right. category. They remain elders. Okay. Um, by naming them here, you've now created a constitutional category of bishops that is separate from elders. Okay. And I don't think that's a, a wise thing to do. Um, I think that you just include the qualifications for bishops as an expression of the order of elders. But if you, as soon as you set them apart, then do they have different rules than elders? Do they have different accountability than elders? Um, do they have different stipulations than elders? I, I think that's a dangerous category to go down. Um, instead of saying that, nope, these are just elders, they have the same responsibilities to holiness that we all do, but they also have additional things that will be clarified by the General Conference uh, under that same order. Well, as I recall, they do have a different process, at least for accountability and uh, having charges filed against them. I mean, they are definitely not treated like any other elder whenever charges are filed against them or accountability needs to be practiced. So. Um, yeah, and this is the interesting thing. 
So they do have, you're right that they do have a, a separate way of which, on which those are adjudicated, mm -hmm. but like the chargeable offenses are the same. Okay, and so sure. the accountability and the level of expectation is the same, even though the way that you would actually work through it is different because they function in a, in a different kind of rule role as an, as an elder. So if there were different charges, then we would have the same problem. But because we have the same list of charges, then categorically they're still uh, elders in that, even though there's a different um, uh, uh, process for prosecuting them, that, that's not a problem. The only problem would be the number, of, the, the list of charges they can be charged with. Uh, I think... I think what you said is correct. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I kind of I kind of jumbled it up. Okay, so I'm just learning to think juridically in this sense or constitutionally, because it does seem to me when there is a different process for seeking justice for a, a, a certain group, then you are separating that group. But but it doesn't seem that way to you. It seems as though they can still be a subgroup within. A larger group, and and it doesn't provide any kind of crisis so far as creating a different group. Not only does it not uh, create a crisis, I think it it fixes possible crises down the road. So, for okay. example, I don't I don't know what paragraph it is in in the proposed uh, book of doctrines and disciplines, but in the old UMC, uh, we had paragraph I think it was three forty, which mm -hmm. was a long list of this is all the things that elders do. Um, and all the responsibilities to to word, to sacrament, to order, uh, mm -hmm. and and it listed out all of those things. And it was it was understood that bishops were held accountable to those same standards, um, even though uh, it didn't specifically have a paragraph on bishops and all the work that they do. Uh, it was understood that, well, they're part of the order of elders, and so this is the work that they do. And then we also have additional things that we're going to add on specifically for bishops. Yeah. But you have the baseline of elder, and then you can build additional things on top of that. Right on. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Okay, so this was, um, okay, 162 was amending uh, Article 5 one, and then he accidentally pasted the next one, I think, where that was. So the next one was Petition 162, which is Article 5, but it's number 2 there. So right. uh, what's this one about? And and this one is a, a good... It's a good example of a lot of the petitions that I've put forward. And so this is just one of those things that we're working on, the internal consistency of the Constitution. Okay. And so this says, to define and establish the qualifications, duties, and responsibilities of the church membership, which shall be open to all who believe. And then I'm adding in in accordance with Article 3 of the Constitution. So Article 3 of the Constitution, which you covered, I think, yesterday on your on your podcast, talks about the membership uh, responsibilities for people who are coming in. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like repentance of sin. It's envisioning a, a sincere desire to live a holy life, baptism, things like that. <clears throat> And so this is we're, we're now giving an enumerated power to the to the general conference. And we and and so we want to make sure that there's not a conflict. So what if the what if the. General conference says you don't need to repent of your sins. To be a member. They have the authority to set what the rules of membership are, according to Article 5, 2 in the constitution. But we also have article three that says, no, repentance of sin is actually something that's required for membership. So, well, which is it? We don't really have a way of figuring that out because there's no levels within the constitution. It's all just either the constitution or not. And so this makes sure that the general conference can set standards, but it doesn't violate the other portions of the constitution. It's in internally consistent is what we're shooting for here. Uh, does, this, does that make sense? I, I, I think so. That well. It's no, I think you did well because I mean the the overall concern is a future generation of the GMC lowers the standards that really they have no right to lower biblically, in my opinion. I mean, if if all of a sudden you you don't make repentance uh, uh, a requirement for entering into covenant with Christ's covenant community, I mean that's just crazy. But I mean. Groups have gone crazy before, so are we going to protect the future from themselves? And in this sense, it makes clear, yeah, there are a lot of things you can change by clear majority vote, but whenever you protect this part, 
and we tether it to this part, then it's going to be harder for future generations to apostatize. So that makes good sense, and I like that um, because I do yep. think there has been a consistent push to lower the standards of discipleship, and, and it's wise to protect the standards. So thank you for that. I really appreciate you doing that. Thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, that is... Uh... Like I said, just working for internal consistency, and and that was just an example of a change that could be made. I'm not saying that the church will make that, um, but again, it's protecting down the road. Like exactly, said. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else to say about that one before 164? Uh, nope. All right. It's, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory there. 164 is now an editorial amendment to paragraph 505. This is going to have to do with the episcopacy. Uh, right. And that's one that uh, I didn't write. Uh, that's actually Keith Boyette who's written this one. And maybe we could pass over that because we'll, we'll talk a little bit about bishops, but I don't want to weigh in too much on the Episcopacy, Episcopacy debate. Okay. Because uh, that's not really my field right now. <laughs> so. Oh, was that was that a TLC one? Oh, yeah, it was. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I should have looked for the name on it. Okay, 165 is back to Shreve Community Church. This is an amendment to Article 5 and then uh, number 3. Yep. So this is uh, including the, the the general conference has the authority. Again, this, these are enumerated powers, listed powers of the general conference uh, to determine the powers and duties. I think that's important of the re annual conferences, regional conferences. And then I am suggesting including circuits, charge conferences and congregational meetings. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for this is we want to have freedom at those levels, but we also want to make sure that we have a framework for which they can work in. Um, and so if you remember in the, in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, there were paragraphs like, uh, uh, the 240, like 246 or 248 that listed out how the charge conference functions and lists how all of the SPRCs function. Those are the enumerated powers that the general conference is giving, and, and they're the framework that the general conference gives for those bodies. This is giving the constitutional right for the general conference to pass. Um, and again, it's that uh, making sure that we have enumerated, we don't want to be taking too much away from the general conference. We want them to allow, we want to allow them to create the framework. That's important. Otherwise, we will have crazy stuff. Um, and uh, some of you viewers might even be aware of some of the crazy stuff that happens at congregational meetings and the meetings after the meetings and things like that. We want to make sure that we have at least some oversight over those committees while we're also giving them the freedom to work in their own local context. And I think this will help do that by clarifying those powers. So if this were not in place, then it could only speak to things down to the annual conference level. This extends the the level at which the general conference can make basic requirements down to the local church. I, I it would be unclear of, of how how far that reaches. This just adds clarity to say nope. The general conference has authority all the way down, um, and they they can make stipulations for how meetings are run. Interesting. Okay, so people so, like who I said, want... it's not the end of the world the way that it's written, but we just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. 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 Um, all right. I'm going to take us down to uh, now seven. So, man, you've 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 really reworked Article Five. All right. Um, Go ahead, take us where you want. Yep, this one's again pretty clear, saying that uh, even though bishops are not their own subcategory or their own separate order, they're within the order of elders, the general conference still has the power to define and fix the powers and duties of members of the episcopacy. It's just adding clarifying language to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and then also to make sure that we have a plan for supporting bishops, however that ends up being played out. Again, I know there are two different visions for what the Episcopacy looks like, um, and I'm not going to weigh in too much on that. But this is making sure regardless of which plan we have, the bishops are taken care of, and also that the General Conference clearly has the authority to, to say what they are allowed to do. Okay. I have. Uh, I feel like you were pretty clear in that. Um, and this is just the way you're characterizing this. It's not radically changing anything. It's just adding clarity for the sake of future generations. So, 
Yeah, that's a lot of the work that I've done is clarifying and uh, making sure that everything's internally consistent while trying to hold on to more historic values that we've had. Okay, that's important to say. All right. Um, Want to go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're moving pretty quick. So yeah. we're so well. Uh, yeah, so this is to uh, amend section 12 of this. Uh, this has to do with the musical resources. Uh, so that would be like a hymnal, uh, worship rituals. That'll be like a book of worship and things of that nature. And so this is allowing the general conference. It has the, the enumerated power to create those documents for use around the world. Um, and I'm adding in subject to the limitations of the restrictive rules. And so this is just to clarify, yeah, you can create a book of worship, you can create a hymnal, but you can't add in any liturgy, you can't in, add in any songs that would violate our core principles in, say, the Articles of Religion. Nice. And so, so this is just making sure that the, the general conference is still adhering to our core principles and to the restrictive rules. So hypothetically, there could be like an activist committee responsible for a new hymnal that puts a bunch of liturgies and hymns in there that are actually not in accord with uh, historic Wesleyan doctrine, which we have uh, ensconced in our, our doctrinal uh, principles, and uh, this would keep them from doing that. Yeah, though I, I think it'd be less likely with the with the music. I think it would be more likely with the rituals. So, for example, in the old book of worship, we had the rituals and the liturgy for marriage. Um, <clears throat> and so you could have a, a group that says, well, we want to include a marriage liturgy that deals with, say, homosexual practice and, and mm -hmm. homosexual unions. If we had this in here, the the general conference could not create liturgy for that because that would violate... Uh, I think it's Article 23 of the Articles uh, of of Religion that says that you can't have rituals that are that basically violate the scriptures, um, um, and so that this would be a way of of protecting the church down the road from things like that. Okay, okay, smart. Keep trucking. Uh, again, same thing with uh, number 14 under Article 5, uh, to act upon petitions. Um, so this is the, the right the General Conference has to vote on petitions at General Conference. Um, and this is to say, yep, they're a lot, they have the, the enumerated power to vote and decide on those, but any petition is subject to the limitations and restrictions of the Constitution of the Church which is to say you can't have a petition that violates the Constitution and still be voted on. That would have to be out of order um, at the general conference level. So before you could entertain a petition that violates the Constitution, you would first need to have a constitutional amendment approved and ratified? Exactly. Hmm. Okay, so that would make it—so hypothetically— uh, we're talking about petitions that would only need to clear by a 50% margin. Hypothetically, mm -hmm. um, there is a petition that only has to clear by a majority vote, but it flies in the face of things that have been established in the Constitution. Um, at that point, usually in the United Methodist Church, the Judicial Council would get involved and then just say, strike it down. But this is getting involved even before that, just saying this petition can't even be considered uh, by the body because it, it flies in the face of what we clearly have written here in the Constitution? Not necessarily. I think the Judicial Council would still, like, you could still appeal um, any decisions to the Judicial Council, or it might be the Judicial Council just rules in anyways. Um, <clears throat> but it it's actually giving the framework for the Judicial Council to actually do that, to say, hey, no, this actually does violate the Constitution, and therefore it's not properly before. Or to, to put it another way, it's unconstitutional. Okay. Um, and, and also that would give the work on the on the back end. So, for example, traditional plan passed in the United Methodist Church, there was the concern that, well, there are a bunch of pieces that were unconstitutional and they were thrown out. They were thrown out because of language like this. Now, whether or not that was good, you can ask different people on, on that particular idea. But they were able to be thrown out because the, the Constitution superseded and said, nope, this is not constitutional, and therefore it cannot be a decision of the General Conference. Even though the General Conference still voted on it, it was uh, in, in, in post-redacted, uh, essentially. 
That was with the 2019 traditional plan. Is that the reference point you were just using? Yeah, that was the first one that came to mind of, yeah. yep, the, the General Conference approved legislation that violated the Constitution, and therefore it was not implemented because it violated the Constitution. And the General Conference didn't have the authority to vote on it, or it didn't have the authority to approve it as an, an enumerated power for the rest of the Church. That was a very frustrating situation. It, it, parts of it got past piecemeal, but it wasn't as comprehensive as it needed to be in order to be effective— uh, yeah, so if we, hmm, I'm still in general, generally in favor of the principle behind that amendment, but man, did it create a mess in the UMC. But if the UMC had defended itself properly, it, it wouldn't have happened. So hopefully in the GMC, we just defend our doctrines and discipline properly. Um, we are at an hour, and I try and keep these things to an hour. Remind me, there's a good another 15 amendments that you've submitted, right? Yep. Okay. Well, then what I think is in order is maybe in a couple weeks we could set up another one of these and go through the rest of them. And I think this is actually more helpful than me going through it on my own first thing in the morning, the way that mm -hmm. I'm going through a lot of the TLC proposals. So um, I, I think that this was the first of a two or three part series on these constitutional amendments. And I think even if people don't care in particular about these issues, I think just learning to think in these ways I just remember in the United Methodist Church, it was all ruled with feelings, and so anytime mm. they made a responsible adult decision, it was like, how dare you, <laughs> you know? And it'd be great if we could uh, create a, a kind of ethos in the GMC where we're more mature in our understanding that, look, we're not going to govern this thing by feelings and intentions. It's going to be governed by the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Words matter, and we need to be responsible with these words. And um, to that end, Nate, I, I really appreciate you taking these things as seriously as you have um, even though it seems a little nitpicky to me because I'm a, a broad strokes kind of guy, um, it conveys a, a great deal of seriousness and honor towards the GMC that you and I are both invested in, and um, I, I hope you get your way. These all seem very wise, so um, I'm excited to see the next batch, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I would agree that it is nitpicky, but again, we're dealing with the foundation and right. uh, the what adage is uh, measure twice, cut once. Oh, sure. And, yeah. Uh, I, I think this is incredibly important, uh, especially at this level. Uh, um, uh, maybe you can cut this out. There, there are two other really important ones that we could cover if, if we have 15 All right, minutes. let's do it. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's, let's do it. And then my viewers, you, you're used to me calling audibles like this. All right, let's do it. Which one are we going to? If we if we want to jump to petition uh, 171, okay, and then we can do petition uh, 181. Okay, okay. Well, I'm at 171, so lead the way. So this is an interesting one that I've got the most uh, question marks about from people who have uh, contacted me, and this has to do with the the terms that we use for uh, districts and circuits. So this is article or yeah, article five or sorry, article six on the annual conference is looking at it's number three. Yes. And it says the one of the enumerated rights of the annual conference is to establish the number of districts within the annual conference. Yes. And uh, I want I want to change that language to circuits. <clears throat> and and this is a very go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I am not immediately seeing why this is important. So help help me go ahead. Well, that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about it, because I, I don't yeah. think it is immediately uh, understood why, why that is the case. Um, so in, in Allegheny West, we have switched over to the term of circuits instead of districts. We have no districts in our annual conference. We call them circuits. Oh. Um, I know in other annual conferences, they are still using the term districts. And the, the first reason for, for having this in the Constitution is being clear that we're all using the same language. So whether we use circuits or whether we use districts is, is not the end of the world, but I think we should all use the same words. Okay. And right now that's up in the air. So that's the, the first reason for having this clarification is saying we should all use the same words. So my and concern would they, be that we approve this, we remove districts, we add circuits, and then annual conferences that use the term districts just think this doesn't apply to them. But that's that's not a possibility here? Oh, it's certainly a possibility, but hopefully uh, presidents pro tem or bishops who are, or whoever in charge 
will help clarify that and do their job. <laughs> okay. So what, what this requires is if we're going to operate with integrity and those who are in charge, see that it applies to them, then they change the nomenclature of their annual conferences to conform to circuits rather than districts. Right. And that would not so happen is, if this was not adopted? Uh, well, it, it might be, but it's, again, it's up in the air right now. Because um, we, we do have different annual conferences using different nomenclature. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And so we, we, we should clarify that one way or the other. Or the or the other. Okay. So if we choose districts, then like my annual conference needs to shift and not use circuits anymore. They need to use districts, so they're all using the same words. Yeah, I don't, I don't see. I don't have any disagreement with that. I my, okay. This one makes less sense to me than the other ones, but I, I, if the end goal is just that we conform the nomenclature across the connection, hundred percent with you. Well, that's not the entirety of the end goal. So that, okay. that's. Part one of the rationale okay. is we should all use the same nomenclature. Part two is why I think circuits are a better language than, or a better word than district. Okay. So circuits are, first of all, more historical. So if we go back to the early, early church, um, <clears throat> uh, early, early expression of, of Methodism, particularly in Great Britain, we see the word circuit that is used. In fact, Wesley has a, a journal entry where he talks about uh, the ideal circuit. And he talks about how he was going on tour in this circuit and people were gathering in different churches. And he, he talked about how wonderful it was that we gathered together and we sang and we prayed and we worshiped together. And that was really what the, the ideal circuit was. It was a place that wasn't really a place of bureaucracy. It was a connection of local churches and of, of, of clergy that said, we're going to gather together intentionally and we're going to worship together. We're going to pray together. We're going to do these spiritual disciplines because uh, they're important for us to get outside of our local church and meet with other brothers and sisters and engage in that. Mm -hmm. And that was how circuits functioned up until right before the, the Civil War. We start to see a, a shift in that, where whenever we have the introduction of more bishops, we get a shift to this idea of instead of having circuits that are just loosely con, uh, grouped together parishes that meet on a regular basis to worship one another, encourage one another, and maybe do ministry together, instead as an extension of the episcopacy. Uh, because we started having district superintendents uh, involved and we had an explosion of of bishops in those years. So, for example, I've, I've got some of my old uh, uh, books of, of discipline from the Methodist Episcopal Church. This one is from uh, 1856. And in 1856, we had seven bishops for the entire world. Mm. Um, and then by the turn of the of the century in 1904, we had almost tripled that mm. uh, and had more than tripled that. We had 23 bishops at that point. And we've seen just a continual explosion of how many bishops we have in the world. <clears throat> um, and as an expression of that, well, we had district superintendents who were then in charge of regional areas because bishops became more regional. They took on more of the roles of the general superintendency and became more local in the work that they do. Obviously, if you have seven bishops for the entire world or even just for the entire United States, you can't have strong regional areas. You send bishops right. wherever you need bishops. Yeah. Um, and, but the more bishops you have, the more regional and more local they become, the more power they have over that region. And so there was a shift more to districts. And so districts became much more of a bureaucratic system and an extension of the Episcopal power through the district superintendent than this loose conglomeration of, of churches that worshiped together. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I think that the term district has a lot of baggage that comes along with it. And it also plays into this idea of what is the episcopacy going to be? Now, I'm not going to weigh in too much on that because uh, we have two different kind of visions of what that right. is. One of them yeah. is the more open, less superintendent work and more just defending the faith around the world. And then we have another vision that has bishops being much more uh, local and, and fulfilling that superintendent role. Um, I, I I personally think that having bishops not be superintendents uh, in that they take care of the temporal needs of a annual conference, but instead are, are more uh, focused on defending the faith and teaching and exhorting and prayer. I think that is a, a better model 
Um, and I think that using the term circuits would tie into that model uh, and, and shift the ethos of what we're doing together. Now, it might not be the model we end up with. Um, and again, that's not the end of the world. I think both plans have their merits as far as the episcopacy but this can be a way of us saying no we're we want to be less bureaucratic we want to be more focused on freedom at the local church level and allowing local churches to say yeah we're going to gather together and pray and worship and exhort one another and not have to have like our official business meeting that is uh super dry and nobody hardly anybody shows up to anyways um so that, that's so kind I, of the reason. I appreciate your thought behind that. I wish it were as simple as changing the nomenclature, and then we could just tap into this previous era and unlock the secrets of it. I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic about that. But if it does lead people to study our history and go, why are we using this word, and what did the church look like before? Then I think it does hold potential. So I'm not gonna. I'm not going to rain on your parade or anything, but I, I do like that you were able to take the time and explain why it is that you like that. And and for the record, I like it too. So anything else to say about this one? Nope. Uh, like I said, it's the world, but I, I do think that be one of the tools that we use in, in talking about who we are and who we're going to be as a church. So. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, the last one for today was 181. Let's see, I'm at 179. There's 181, to amend Article 11.1 of the proposed Constitution. Yeah, so Article or 181 and 182 kind of work together. They're both amending the, the restrictive rule. So just, again, refresher for your viewers, the restrictive rule is that three-fourths majority, the top level of anything that we change, these are the things that are most core to who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that it would be it would behoove the church as Wesleyans to include and articulate in the restrictive rule the Articles of Religion, the Confessions of Faith, Wesleyans explain, Wesley's explanatory notes upon the New Testament, and the Standard Sermons of John Wesley, and any of our other doctrinal foundations that we have. So again, that's moving these documents out of the simple majority to change section and moving it into the three quarters majority to change section. And I think that is important because again, these are these are who we are. This is this is tied to uh like you can't get any more core to Wesleyanism than these documents. Um and so I think that they should be protected at the highest level. So the second part of that, you maintain this language of this restrictive rule shall not apply to the development of the combined articles of religion and confession of faith. So these things are not at odds. You can have the part that you offered, which explicitly protects those two documents, and have this bottom part that says, actually, we can combine them. No big deal. Yeah, exactly. The, okay. the historic language, I was pulled directly from the United Methodist Constitution, and uh, I, I don't see a problem with it being there, as, as long as we're being very careful about how we make a combined uh, document. Yeah. To your knowledge, has such a document been crafted yet? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. That doesn't mean okay. there aren't things in the works, but I'm just not pretty sure. Them. But to your knowledge, okay. there is nothing in this uh, document full of petitions that actually contains the language of such a document. That That's not coming before the convening conference, to your knowledge? No, they're just two petitions that would basically okay. say, we're going to create a task force or we're going to empower a group to create that document and bring it to the next general conference. That makes sense. Okay. All right, well, we did it, and um, yeah, we'd already talked through the importance of those documents, and uh, uh, it's something that I, I share, actually, with you, a, a shared concern. There's just so much that, like, if you don't have the notes on the New Testament and the sermons in particular, there's a lot of the ethos that really mi you miss, and I, I like having those different levels of texture, so I, I know there are a lot of people who get frustrated. You, you can't bring somebody up on charges for preaching against some small section on a John Wesley sermon, but um, there's still great standards for us to have, so thanks for protecting them. We had talked at the beginning of this thing. You said you'd be willing to pray for uh, the general conference delegates and for my audience. Would you be willing to do that now? I certainly would be. Perfect. Heavenly Father, you are a good God, and... Uh, because of your grace, you have birthed this new expression of, of Wesleyanism here in the world. And uh, 
we thank you that we get the, the honor of being a part of that, uh, the responsibility of being a part of that. Uh, Lord, I pray especially for the delegates who are going to be heading to General Conference. I pray for safety in travels, so that there wouldn't be any hiccups or problems with getting voices from all over the world there so that as one body we can make decisions that are in line with your will. And so, Lord, protect our delegates no matter where they're coming from so they can arrive safely and without problems. I pray that uh, you would pour out your spirit on all of us delegates and uh, alternates and everyone who's going to be there, uh, that we would have a, a special level of wisdom that as we read through a, a lot of uh, legislation and uh, some of it is very dry, we ask that you would help us to keep our focus, that we would understand the consequences of things that we do so that we can be creating uh, and building your church in yes. line with your will. Yes. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, myself and all of the other people who have submitted legislation. We're obviously very invested in this. And so uh, we ask that pride would not get in the way of us doing your will, um, that we wouldn't hold too closely to the work that we've done, knowing that uh, many voices together are, are better than just us. And so uh, humble us in those ways. Uh, I pray also for everybody else who is watching, um, for for. Jeff and all of his audience, Lord, I, I thank you for the diligence that they have and and being curious and trying to understand uh, the complexities of all that we're doing. Lord, I ask that you would empower them to be diligent in their prayers, praying for all of us, that it wouldn't be a, a secondhand thing that they do uh, whenever they remember, but instead that it would be a part of their daily disciplines, that they would be lifting up the church yes. Yes. Uh, so that we can do everything to the best of our ability and so that we can... Uh, reflect your glory in the world. Yes, Father. And most importantly, I pray for us as a church, together yes. as a body, that we would not lose sight of uh, the, the doctrines and the discipline with which we first set out, but that we would be a, a church that is alive, that is doing amazing things to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, um, and so that we can be a part of building heaven here on earth. And so help us to proclaim boldly what we know to be true. And Lord, work in the hearts of those that we proclaim to so that they might come to know your love, repent of their sins, and uh, join in this wonderful uh, body that uh, we get to, the privilege to be a part of. Mm. And so Lord, be with us, keep us safe, keep us diligent, keep us disciplined, uh, and work through us for your glory. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, it's uh, I, it's not always the most um, engaging, exciting work, but I, I think it is important work. And so uh, y'all pray for Nate and his job and what he's doing over the coming. He's going to be a delegate at this inaugural uh, gathering. It's just going to be a big, amazing time. And so hold them up in your prayers. If you're not aware, um, the denomination has published a, uh, a prayer guide leading up to General Conference. And if you haven't... Um, downloaded that the website is at so the world will know dot org and then if you click on prayer you can download the 40 day prayer guide and um you know you don't need a guide if you don't want one you can just pray for them and so do that and then also um if you haven't subscribed to me already just go ahead and do that so you can stay apprised of what's going on i'm going to do my best to cover as many petitions as i can between now and then so that when the time rolls around and we're all watching live you can track what's going on and know the significance of these things. So pray for me that I, I do a good job at this so that people um, know what's coming up. So God bless you for engaging. And uh, Nate, one more time, God bless you. Thank you for your service, and thanks for joining me today. Thank you. All right. Bye, friends.